Uh, welcome to my talk. Um, Today, I want to give you an overview of the work that I've been doing for the past four months. I've been working on uh, Python bindings and C bindings for the Nix interpreter. And I want to tell you about this new way that I've been working on to use Nix, um, how it works, the challenges I had, what you can do with it, and hopefully I can give you some hackathon ideas. But first, I want to tell you why would you want to do this. The answer, um, well, there are a lot of tools that use Nix indirectly. So besides having a U type Nix eval or something, there are some things, notably Nix ops, Colmina, one of the new things that people keep talking about. Uh, they all basically um, call a call a Nix interpreter from a subprocess. So what you do is you write a Nix file. You have a Nix file. You give it some arguments. Uh, based on what you want to know from some Nix code. Uh, you call Nix instantiate, dash dash XML. Nix instantiate does a whole lot of work. Then it returns a big XML file or JSON file. Um, then you parse that. This is quite slow, because um, when you do this, you have to actually have Nix evaluate all of your file, not just the specifics that you want to know. And if you decide that you're interested in a tiny part, then you have to evaluate all of it again, uh, just to drill down into some uh, tiny part of it. The upside is this is quite stable. Like If you wrote this in 2012 and you use it now, it still works. It will show some warnings, probably, some deprecation things. But it will still work. However, um, my employer, have had some tests that we wanted to run. We had some unit tests, and those involve um, calling Nix with some code, having it crash, doing that again, a whole bunch. This was kind of slow to do this way. So we worked on another way. Basically, you can link um, the Nix interpreter directly into your own code. Um, this existed for a while. It was written by MIG92, I think in 2017. Um, yeah, so this works. Like you have a thing called um, Python X. Um, you import that, then you tell it, "Hey, I want to evaluate this specific Nix code and give me the JSON output of that." Then, if you do it again, it will cache it and it will be pretty fast. However, this sort of stopped working in the next Nix version because, well, this uses the Nix internal API. Nix internal API is unfortunately not stable. Like they want to change this basically every time something they want. Well, every time they want to do something, this changes. So that's uh, annoying. So you have to maintain this, and you have to maintain this for Python. If you do this in Rust, you also have to maintain the separate thing in Rust. But this is really fast. Um, so how can we fix this compatibility issue? Basically. Um, this is what I've been working on for the past four months. You um, don't link directly to the Nix unstable internal API, but you write a different API, in my case, a C API. Um, then you have some glue code from your Python that you can call the C API using a tool called CFFI, which generates the Python bindings necessary to call into the C API quite nicely and uh, without a lot of trouble and have some Python code to make this nice, have wrapped it around, you will see. Um, the upside of this is hopefully we can keep the C API stable. Uh, I have a pull request open for it. Uh, it's not merged yet, but it's in review by Robert, who might be here, not seeing him. Uh, then I have some Python code. It's in, a, it's in the repository, it's not in Next community yet. It's in tweak slash Next Python, I think. I have a link on the sides later. Uh, I hope that this will solve basically all of these compatibility problems forever, or at least well for the coming future, since um, the C API will be upstream, and if it's broken, the people breaking it will know, and they will have to fix it to have their um, tests pass and their pull requests being green. However, you might think, and a lot of the people commenting on my pull request thought, why would you want a C API in the year of the of our Lord uh, 2023? It's a good question. Uh, you might be thinking C is a programming language from the 1970s. Why would you use this nowadays? 
Well, it turns out uh, C is a programming language from the 1970s. So everyone uses it these days. And this is why you should also use it. It's no longer really a programming language. It's more of an uh, interface. Um, like if your program talks C and your other program also talks C, then you can communicate. You can do this basically from any language you can imagine. Like it works with Rust, it works with Swift, it has called Python JavaScript. Um, this talk is about the Python bindings. I just talked to uh, our host who um, apparently, uh, okay, I'm not supposed to tell anyone. Uh, I know someone who has chicken scheme bindings for this. <laughs> Uh, then I've also written uh, JavaScript bindings for this. Uh, however, uh, the C API turned out to be quite a bit of work. Like, it sounds good, you just um, take your Python, you check out what it has to do, then you implement that in C, and then you do that again if you're missing a bit, and you do that again if you're missing a bit. Well, it's, it's quite big. Like, I squashed it down, it's still 30 ad commits um, with quite a bit of files changed, a lot of people commenting about this, having opinions, tests failing, mostly on macOS. Turns out that um, linking, uh, well, uh, it turns out that having some Python linking that to the Nix library and having that be your own Nix library, not the system library, is annoying on macOS because there's no sandbox. So uh, Sylvan, my coworker, fixed the sandbox. This was quite annoying to fix, uh, because if you turn on the sandbox, the CI will no longer pass. Everyone commented on this. The sandbox doesn't work on macOS. Um, then we had to change, well, I had to change so many things that Robert decided this is no longer a stable C API. This is going to be towards a stable C API. <laughs> so I think that's quite sad. But um, I see his point, and I do think that if we merge this and it will remain stable for a year, we can drop the toward and it will be stable. Uh, especially if we have some feedback, maybe we'll change a lot, and then it can be stable. But the plan is definitely to have this be stable, maybe version it, but hopefully have it work for the foreseeable future. Then there are, well, there were two annoyances with making a C API based on the C++ language. Like the Nix, um, the Nix interpreter throws a lot of errors, mostly C++, well, always C++ exceptions. If you have a C++ exception in your chicken scheme interpreter or your Python interpreter, um, bad things will happen. In JavaScript as well, uh, terrible things will happen because it has to unwind the stack and it won't fight the right fra frame pointers. It will be terrible. Um, then there is a problem with the garbage collector. So uh, Nix uses the bone garbage collector. Python uses its own garbage collector. No idea what chicken scheme does. Rust, I think you can implement drop, not sure. But yeah, having it, you have to be able to tell Nix, hey, I'm still using this value, don't throw it away. So on to implementation. I'll show you a bit what can you do with the C API, and then I'll move on to Python. So you can do three basic things with the C API. You can evaluate expressions from strings. You can inspect the returned expressions. And you can actually implement functions, um, use them to modify the um, next values that you pass to it, return them. You can add them to built-ins. So quite a bit of cool stuff. Oh, then, well, we have the annoyance of the error handling and the garbage collectors all worked it out. So you start out with this um, eval expression thing. Uh, it seems reasonable enough. You pass it an evaluator, an next version, uh, the value where it returns, and you pass it to nil. Um, that's nice. However, oh dear, this, yeah, terrible. Uh, this, is, this is what it then looks like. You have to, um, well, uh, we, have to we have to catch the thrown C++ exception in the C API. So we have to store it somewhere. Uh, I first um, did this in a global variable that my roommate um, found out. I was no longer allowed to do that. <laughs> <laughs> 
then uh, yeah, I decided, okay, you have to pass an argument where it can store the possible error, maybe store some configuration, which is not great, not terrible, I think. So after every function call that can fill, you have to inspect this. It looks a bit terrible in C. It looks really nice in Python. I think you can make it look better in C with some macros. So you get the context. You can um, see what kind of error happened. There is a bunch of error message functions for this. Uh, then on to garbage collection. Um, what we do here is we have a reference counter for every value that you get from the Nix API. Um, as long as the internal reference counter is higher than zero, uh, the API keeps around your value. So if you are done with your value, you have to uh, decrement the reference counter, and at some point it will be gone. You have to, yeah, then there's the added complication. You have to also do this for errors. But uh, the reference counter also works out in like, everything except C. And maybe even in C, you can make it look nice with attribute finalized. I'm not sure about that. Might be evil. So on to the Python part. Um, you have the CFFI. It generates a low-level um, binding. So you actually get the C++, the C API there with the next C context create and the next expert evo from string. You wouldn't want to do this in Python because Python is usually higher level. It has all those magic methods. So here you can see how this ends up. Um, you can actually just import next packages, do things with it. Um, I have a demo for you guys. So pray to the demo gods that that works. OK, zoom, enhance. Then I can hopefully type in that and see it myself. OK, so we have import Nix. We can actually get the built-ins. There's a bunch of built-ins, 115. We can get the import function from it. We can import. Let's pretend I wrote Nix package. I, I just wrote Nix packages here. Ah, sure. This big enough? Okay. So pretend that I wrote Nix packages here. I promise you this is next packages. There's 20,000 attributes in it. And we can actually look at them. So here's my next derivation for hello. I can probably look at it. Meta license. Yeah, it exists. P name. This is something that you can actually look at at some point. And there, it's something that you can build. So that's the first demo. So there's some more cool stuff that you can do with this, but I'll show that later. Uh, let me see. Back to this. Yeah. And here, back to this. OK, so that's the first part of my talk. Uh, but my talk was called Calling um, Nix from Python, Calling Python from Nix. I've only been talking to how you can call Nix from Python, which I think is the most useful part. But I was afraid that my talk wouldn't get accepted if I didn't do something horrible. So I also have the second part. <laughs> I, I don't think that this is very useful. But I do think that there are some interesting things that lie in this direction that we should definitely look at. And it was quite easy to make. That's another reason that I wanted to do this. There is a thing called Nix plugins, where you um, have a linked library. You pass it to the um, Nix interpreter. You put this in a config file or whatever. And it loads this. And then you can modify the, Nix, the, the internal state with it and expose some built-ins, whatever. This is documented, believe it or not. <laughs> this is from the manual. Uh, don't read all of this. 
I have this in a, I, I've highlighted the parts that are uh, useful for us. So you can add new premops or constants to the expression language, which means you can add functions to built-ins, basically. You can add new store implementations. I haven't worked on that part in the C API, but it sounds fun. Um, you can add new subcommands. I don't see why you would do this. In, so you have Nix space something instead of Nix dash something. Don't really see the point. You can add Nix config settings, which is OK, sure. Then it warns you these APIs are inherently unstable and may change from release to release. Well, I fixed that. I hope that the line will go. Yeah, the line goes right through it. Great aspect ratio problems. So do people actually, do people use this? Did they use this before today? Well, I did. Um, I'm not sure how many other people did, but um, I was fed up with Haskell.nix being slow, and I noticed, I, I profiled it, and it was actually spending seconds in the JSON parser. Um, so what I did to fix that is have um, a thing called synth JSON, which parses gigabytes of JSON per second, and I hacked that into the Nix interpreter using a plugin, and it sped up my Haskell.nix quite a bit, so that was a nice use case. But then a year later it broke, of course. So this is one of my reasons for finally working on this. Um, here's what I made for this talk. I have a plugin file. Um, it has a py import primitive. You can use this to import your Python modules and then call things in your Python modules. Um, someone on the forums was asking a while ago, how can I have base64 uh, inside the Nix interpreter? <laughs> so yeah, I, this is my proposal. Um, I think there are better ways. Uh, I hope there are better ways. Uh, but um, I also think that this could be extended to like um, read Tomo, um other things that are currently built and that don't really have to be. But I'm not sure if uh, anyone will agree with me. Um, then there's another really cool thing. You can actually get the std env uh, called make derivation, build a package. So I will demo that. So I have this horrible command that you have to trust me on this. Um, basically, ah, you can see the highlight. But basically, this um, adds a plugin file and sets some Python path and works around some bugs in the current Nix version that should be fixed in a week or so, but still aren't. We have this thing. It loads Nix packages for me, and then it loads my py import file. So I have py import. And I'll show you first the base64 thing. It actually fails to re-export all of this because it does import base64 internally. Then it does some magic to set encodings right because I don't really support bytes yet. And I'm not sure if I ever want to. But the nice part about this is you can actually call Python from Nix. There we go. And just to prove to you that that's the real value, when I find my cursor, there, it says hello. So I hope that's enough for you. Then I have the, the other thing. I can, let me, let me show you the um, example that I wrote for this. So this does def hello, return packages, stdm, make derivation. It sets a name, it sets, an, it sets a source. So let me try if I can actually build this package now. OK, so this gives me a primop. And this gives me a derivation. Now I can try to build this. It builds. So. Yeah, I think, I think you can see the application for this. Well, I hope not from Python, maybe from Python. Chicken scheme sounds really nice, actually, to do this in. Um, yeah, you have to trust me that this build it takes, it takes a while. It was almost done, great. Then let's go back to the slide. You can try this at home. 
Um, I wrote the next flag for this. It's uh, on the Twi GitHub repo. <laughs> At some point, hopefully, when the pull request is merged, I can move it into the um, a next community um, organization and keep maintaining this for a while. Um, if you want my slides, there's a link down below. Um, then I have some hackathon ideas for you. Um, basically, I want all of you to use this, give me feedback. What are the annoying parts? What are the nice parts? How can we improve this? Uh, then I want all of you to take your tools that currently uh, use Nix via um, subprocess to start using it in this way. Uh, I would like also to work on the store API. Currently, it's only the expression. Uh, the, um, it's currently on the, the Nix expert, and I would also want to see Nix store, which I had some. I heard some interesting ideas about. Um, yeah, having more language bindings would be nice. I'm currently working on some JavaScript bindings. Um, they, there might be Rust bindings. I don't know. Um, then. Uh, one thing that I would be really excited about is WASM, WebAssembly Imports, um, because, well, the things that I've been doing suffer from some purity issues, because it's Python, you can do horrible things with networks, with whatever, and uh, my hope is that with WebAssembly you can actually be pure, and this might even be nice uh, to write software for and have some base64 WASM module that you can import in Nix and use. Then. A shout out to my employer, Tweek, who let me work on this, and our client, Antithesis, who sponsored me for part time for four months to work on this. And uh, yeah, that's my talk. Any questions? Hello. So I have a microphone, so I get to ask the first question. Um, so now that you can you know, talk to Nix from essentially any language that speaks C. Um, is there a possible, how thread safe is this if you want to do something truly cursed? Uh, well, I think it's actually quite nice. Let me see if I can find the slide where this is talked about a bit. Uh, so if you see this, you have an evaluator argument. You also have a context argument. And um, those are not thread safe, but you can make more and you can use them from different threads at the same time. And in fact, Hydra sort of works like this. It has multiple of these evaluators, and it uses them at the same time. So that sort of works. And if you get the evaluator into some impossible state, which should be hard, but might be doable, then you can make a new one. So you need, uh, <coughs> you need to do any locking f to make sure it's consistent, or? Uh, no, okay. you just have to, well, you have to use one evaluator and one context at the same time, and not do it from multiple threads. Um, if you do it for multiple threads, you should have locking, yes. Interesting. <laughs> oh, no. Other questions? All right. I'm not going to give myself a pog. Uh, to what extent can the C API do um, deserialization of functions? Um, sorry, could you give an example? Um, so if essentially taking a partially evaluated um, abstract syntax tree and then turning that back into um, deserializing that back out to next source. Um, that's, uh, so the question is, can I take a next tree, um, then um, get it back into a next source? Um, I don't think this is possible currently. I also think that Nix itself cannot do this. Like, uh, there is a thing called Nix dash dash parse and it will print some not quite Nix code, I believe. So Thank you. I currently don't have the API for this, but you would be welcome to contribute. Uh, it, probably a bit similar to the first question. So uh, Nix is a, is a lazy language, not as lazy uh, as you expect when you come from Haskell, but still, uh, when you show it through a C API or interact with, with, with Python, both are not lazy at all by default. So uh, is this causing uh, any challenges uh, for both directions, or was it, is it not problematic? Um, it was a bit of a problem to think about this, but um, in the end, it turns out to be mostly fine. So yes, you have laziness. Um, first, uh, at first, I had tongues. You had to uh, before you did anything, you would have to call a force function. Um, my roommate found out; he disliked it. 
So then uh, I uh, changed this to be um, basically if you evaluate anything, you are probably interested in the result, right? If you access any attribute, you are probably interested in that attribute. So I changed this to always force, and now you don't really end up with any things unless you're writing your own function when you have to have some laziness in your arguments. But there is a lot of documentation on this. Um, I think it's linked from the pull request. I hope to get it into the next manual. And you can actually look at how this all works. Uh, thanks for a great talk. Uh, my question is, uh, from uh, when you call Nix from Python, uh, I expect that Python keeps uh, the Nix stage around between the life of Python interpreter. How easy it is to clean the Nix stage and basically how easy it would be to use Python notebooks like Jupyter instead of Nix REPL with just some extra magic? Um, I, I think if I understood your question, you asked like, okay, um, Python um, keeps the state of the Nix warm. Um, actually, this is a high-level API that I wrote. So it, it caches the interpreter from call to call. But there is a low-level API that allows you to make your interpreter and then reuse that um, over time. Then you asked about JuPyter Notebook. I think it would be great to see this in a JuPyter Notebook, actually. Okay, any more questions? Yes, let me make my way. Okay, let's get the one that's close to me first. Um, do you think that the Nix Python API could eventually be used to replace internal Nixos commands like Nixos rebuild? Uh, yes, in fact, I hope that it can. Um, the question is, can we um, use this to rewrite current tools um, to be nicer than the current bash tools? Um, one of the uh, candidates for this was, I think, called... Uh, it, it was a next documentation tool that would dump a module um, for some documentation. So I tried my hand at that in Python. It was actually quite nice. Um, they removed thousands of, C code, thousands of lines of C++ code, turned it into 20 lines of Python. So I hope we can do that to more tools. Um, what about uh, um, string context? Uh, did, they, did they cause any problems? For example, uh, I, I saw that you had to explicitly turn a, a Nix string into a Python string. That's maybe why. Um, so, um, the question is, do string context cause any problems? Um, I think, um, and what, what I did was call str on a Nix thing to turn it into a Python thing. Um, Nix string contexts aren't really a problem in practice. If you want to modify them, there are actually some built-ins to do this already. Um, you can make them with some evaluation interpolation magic. Uh, so, this is why I don't have it exposed in the API, even though it would be nice to expose this in the API. It's not strictly necessary. And um, as for what I showed with the, with the STR, um, Python usually does the um, conversion quite implicitly. So there is a lot of magic um, methods as an underscore underscore STR underscore underscore int. It will mostly just work. But I showed this to that you see that, yes, the Python, the Python methods understand these next things as well. All right, we have time for one more question. Um, since you are like like going in and out of like Python types as well, have you like considered or at least like looked at the performance implication of like serializing or like going through this language boundary? Um, I don't think there is much of a performance implication in Python because um, Python is already quite slow, so I don't think that. <laughs> So, um, if, you, if you use this from JavaScript, it will be slow, because V8 does quite a bit of tracing. It can't do this across your language boundary. But in Python, there's no optimization whatsoever. So, it's actually not really slow. And <coughs> you also asked about serialization overhead. Well, it's mostly, it's mostly cached. Um, and also, you don't really serialize a lot of things. Uh, you just do the tiny bit that you're interested in, which is a um, huge benefit of this thing over a subprocess. All right, our next speaker has a, is executing his uh, speaker privilege and requests a question. Uh, who is your, uh, your roommate? <laughs> <laughs> uh, my roommate is uh, Lars Jellema, uh, Lucas16. Um, I think you can look that up. And, uh, uh, he currently works at Lumiguide. Yeah, I think that's it for everyone. Uh, thank you for your attention. And, uh, Let's give him a round of applause.